16th chapter of John. We're just going to do the first four verses tonight. Let's read together. John 16, 1 through 4. The Lord speaking. These things I have spoken to you, speaking to the eleven, so that you may be kept from stumbling. They will make outcasts, make you outcasts from the synagogue. But an hour is coming for everyone who kills you to think that he is offering service to God. These things they will do because they have not known the Father or me. But these things I have spoken to you so that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told you of them. These things I did not say to you at the beginning because I was with you. Uh, the Lord Jesus is spending time now in chapters 14, 15, and 16 as they are moving on their way uh, to the Garden of Gethsemane. And he is spending time telling them some of the most important things that they're going to need to have before he goes. What is fascinating about this is he opens up the 16th chapter, and obviously he's not reading from the 16th chapter. This is the real deal that's going on, and this has been recorded for us. But he starts off by telling us, or telling the 11, that there's a storm coming, and it's a storm in regards to persecution. It's a storm in regards to possible death. And I just want you to know that I'm throwing you into the deep end of the pool. This is what he's essentially saying. I'm throwing you into the deep end of the pool. He's already been telling them that he's leaving them. And now, here's some very serious things. Now, he's been with them for three and a half years. Now, it's time to start swimming. Got to take the water wings off, and it's time that you start uh, to deal with the promises, the power that I have promised you, um, the anointing that has been passed on to them, the experiences that they've already had. You know, he's not just throwing them in. They've been here before. They've been through Matthew 10, see. They've been through Luke 10, the 12, then the 70 that go out, and Christ anoints them with his power to preach, to heal the sick, to cast out demons, to raise from the dead. In other words, all of these important miraculous things that verifies and backs up the truth of what is being preached. They've got it. But he's always been around. They knew that when they came back to meet with him at wherever that might have been after they had done their, their tour, you know, that he would be there going back to Jesus, see. And we've already had... Uh, some of these statements by him that I'm leaving, but this is to your advantage that I go, because if I don't go, who won't come? The Spirit. Yeah, the Holy Spirit. If I don't go, the Holy Spirit will not come. And this is better, he's been telling them, chapter 14, chapter 15, chapter 16. It's better that I go. Because the Holy Spirit will be inside of you. It's the same Holy Spirit that's inside of me, Jesus is essentially saying, who enables me, because I'm baptized with him, you're about to be baptized with him, he enables me to do all these things, speak in this way, have this backbone well, like a spiritual fence post in your back to stand against the galing, howling winds of opposition in your personal life, in your public life, standing for Christ. See? He's got to come. He's the most important thing. Well, they're not really buying that right now because they don't know anything about this. They've had no experience. They've been experiencing Jesus for three and a half years. And so I've titled the teaching tonight, Surviving the Storms. And the question that we have to ask right away is how? How will these 11 guys survive these storms that are coming? And by way of that, how am I going to do it? How am I going to survive the storms? Some of us have already been through some pretty major storms in our lives. Others, maybe, you know, we might have more storms to go. But the way we will survive will be the exact same way that Jesus is teaching the 11 here of how they will survive. And we've already seen a few things as to what goes into surviving these storms. We've already seen it here in John's Gospel. For instance, here's, a, here's, a, here's an example. One way that they're going to survive these storms that are coming is, first of all, by deciding and being real disciples. Now, that may not grab you right away, but think about it. 
by being a real disciple. He talked to them about this in the 13th chapter, verses 33 and 35. 13th chapter, verses 33 and 35, and he says, Little children, I am with you a little while longer. See? You will seek me, but as I said to the Jews, now I also say to you, where I am going, you cannot come. A new commandment I give you, that you love one another, even as I have loved you, that you also love one another. Very powerful, loving one another. By this, all men will know that you are my what? Disciples, if you have love one for another. So knowing and deciding that you're going to be a real disciple, which means that you're going to agape, you're going to lay down your life, lay down your personal desires, lay down your personal wants, put yourself somewhere way down the ladder rung and get everybody else above you. That's the only way that you can be the greatest in the kingdom. And I'm not really suggesting that Jesus is saying aspire to being the greatest in the kingdom, but since they brought it up in another place, the way is to be a servant of all. And that's, that's complete love. To be a, not a servant because it is slave. Be the slave of all. Uh, Paul liked to use the, the phraseology that had to do with a slave that was like the third level galley slave on a ship. He used that in different places. And these are the guys that are like stuck way at the bottom, chained to the oars. These are the rowers. I mean, these guys were the dregs. These were the guys, you know, that had the drum beating at the end of the, the ship, you know, and the guys walking up and down the, the aisle, as it were, and he's got that whip. And if you're slacking, you know, you get a taste of that, right? He says, if you're going to survive these storms, you're going to have to decide that you're going to be a real disciple of mine. A disciple, of course, is a learner. And if you don't walk in love, just like we've been learning a little bit uh, this last Sunday morning, 1 Corinthians 13, if you're not walking in love, it doesn't matter if you've got like prophecy or you speak in tongues of men and angels. It doesn't matter because love sets it up for the absolute gift. It's the absolute act of giving and it asks for nothing in return. So you want to survive the storms that are coming? Be a real disciple. Secondly, you can survive the storms that are coming by believing Christ goes to prepare a topos for you. We've been over this so many times, John 14. The first three verses, I go away to prepare a place for you, the Greek word being topos. It's an office, it's an opportunity, it's a responsibility of ministry. If I go away to prepare that for you, I will come again and draw you, bring you to myself. So that where I am, you may be also here in a place of ministry. For the, for the 11, that would be the fulfillment of what he said, that when I come back, you will sit on these 12 thrones, judging the 12 tribes of Israel. That's something that went on during the book of, of, of Acts, for that matter. And it certainly went on thereafter in AD 70, after he returned. So that's how we survive a storm. What is your topos? Be about being in your office. See? Third, you will survive these storms by doing the greater works through the means of prayer. John 14 again, but this time it's verses 12 through 15. I'm going to skip that too because I know you already know that. Jesus says, greater works than these will you do because I go to the Father. And then he tells us how those greater works are achieved through prayer. He says, and whatsoever things you pray for, ask for, believing, you will receive. Now multiply that and how much greater. We got to hear some of that testimony tonight with, with uh, Ann telling us more about Lisa and this horrendous cancer that she's dealing with in her body and she's chewing away, eating away. We're starting to see some results, some grace. God responds to his people when they pray, when they lay down their lives in love for somebody else, asking for the benefits and the prosperity of somebody else like this woman and her son and her husband. It's a greater work through the means of prayer. Fourth, how am I going to survive the storms? How about by knowing that they are not going to be left behind as orphans? Jesus said that in John 14, 16 through 18. I think I'll look at that. John 14, 16 through 18. He says, I will ask the Father and he will give you another paraclete. In other words, the one who comes alongside, right? That he may be with you forever. That is the spirit of truth whom the world cannot receive because it does not see him or know him, but you know him because he abides with you and will be in you. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. And see, he lines himself up with the person of the Holy Spirit. 
Because 2 Corinthians 3.17 says that the Holy Spirit is the Spirit of Christ. And yet the Holy Spirit is a separate personality among three personalities in the Godhead. See, I don't understand. Well, get in line. I don't either. Well, that's what the Bible teaches. What's the struggle? What's the struggle? It's all got to compute with my pea-headed brain. You know, well, you're lucky to live to 80 years of age, and then you'll be over with, and somebody else will be there to take your place going, I don't understand. <laughs> he says, he says, because the Holy Spirit as the paraclete is coming, I'm not leaving you as an orphan. What's an orphan? An orphan is somebody without parentage. He says, but the Holy Spirit becomes that parent, if you will. And he's going to be inside all of you, just like he's inside of me right now. And the boys are listening to Jesus and they're going, I don't get this at all. You know? But it's going to require afterwards, after Jesus ascends, after he sends the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost, then the eyes get open. You're going to have to survive these storms by knowing that you're not an orphan. You're going to survive these storms by knowing that the word of Christ has to abide in you. Then you can ask whatever you will. That's John 15 and verse 7. You abide in me, and if my words abide in you, you will ask what you will. That's no problem for, for, for God to say that, because if his words are abiding inside of you, then your requests are going to be what? They're going to be based upon that word. So you're not going to be asking for selfish, you know, sinful things, ridiculous things, out of the will of God things, because they're going to be framed and formed by the will of God. You want to survive the storm? The word better dwell in you richly. You need, you need to make right requests, knowledgeable requests, requests that are based on the knowledge of Scripture. Finally, in chapter 15, verses 16 and 19, if you're going to survive the storms, like these guys are going to need to survive, they're going to need to have the knowledge of their election, which he tried to give them. Chapter 15, verse 16, you did not elect me, but I elected you. Remember, that's the meaning behind egleko. You did not elect me, but I elected you and appointed you to go bear much fruit, that your fruit would remain so that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he may give it to you. He said similarly, in verse 19, same chapter, if you were of the world, the world would love its own. But because you're not of the world, but I chose you or elected you out of the world because of this, the world hates you. So there's six things right there that they've already been given, right? Already been given. Now, with that in mind, he's got this bag full of these promises that he's already made to them right now. So now he's going to talk to them about surviving something known as a stumbling, which is our first point on your outline, which leads us to verse 1 of chapter 16, where Jesus says, These things I have spoken to you that you may be kept from stumbling. First thing I want you to notice about verse 1 right here is the opening phrase. These things I have spoken to you. Look down at verse 4. Verse 4. But what? These things I have spoken to you. Oh, my gosh. It's the same thing. Well, what's up with that? Well, what do we got? We got bookends again. We got bookends again. We have a statement and a basis to how, for how to stop stumbling. And that means all of the instruction that's in between verse 1 and the bottom of verse 4, all that instruction is all based on what Christ has spoken to them. All based on what Christ has spoken to. So what does he say in verse 1? Well, the area of not stumbling is there. How do I not stumble? Well, that information is based on what Christ has spoken to them. In other words, it's been recorded for us in the word. Verse 2 outcasting, being thrown out of the synagogue. How am I going to survive that? Well, it's something Christ has spoken to. Bottom of verse 2, how about killing you, murder? Well, that's something that Christ is speaking to. These persecutions are done in a religiously driven fervor, verse 3 says. Verse 3 says, these things they will do because they have not known me or the Father, but they're driven by their religion. We'll talk about that. Now, back up to the top of verse 1, these things I have spoken to you. Now, the Greek word there for spoken, you can hear the aorist in there, uh, or what sounds like an aorist. It's laleo for spoken, but it's actually a perfect tense verb form. So it's a completed action. We've actually got a perfect active indicative here. And it's Christ's word that is perfect and complete and all that you need to survive this coming storm. 
That's what he's getting across there by the grammatical inflection relative to the tensing. Perfect, completed action, you see. He says, I have spoken unto you, completed word. It's everything you need to know. It's everything you need to know. He already talked to them earlier about the fact that his word had already purged them or cleaned them. Chapter 15 and verse 3. Chapter 15 and verse 3. He says to them, you are already clean or you have been pruned because of the word which I have, what? Spoken to you. So Christ's active, perfect word cleans us, prepares us, and readies us to go through surviving these storms uh, in particular. There's different uses of laleo, and they're very similar to this in, in John's gospel. I'll give you some example. Uh, the first example would be in John 6:63. 6, John 6.63, this is the idea of in order to survive, we need the words that are spirit and life. Surviving the storms means we need the words of spirit and life. John 6, verse 63, Jesus says, it is the spirit who gives life. The flesh, that's you and all of your brilliance, me and all of my genius, the flesh profits nothing. I get nothing from that. I get no return from that. Yeah, but it's got to be a little profitable. No, the flesh profits nothing. That means anything outside of the words of the Spirit is worthless. Wait a minute. You don't mean everything. No, everything. Jesus said it profits nothing. Nothing. What is nothing? Nothing's a giant donut hole. There's nothing there. Nothing there. It profits nothing. The words I have spoken to you are spirit and life. Oh, so that's the spirit that gives life. The vehicle by which the spirit gives life are Jesus' words. Now, remember, Jesus' words are not only recorded in the Gospels. They are what is being recorded in the epistles. That's the continuation of Jesus' teaching. See? They get that from the Lord. They get that from him. So in order to survive, we need the words of spirit and all. Those are the types of spoken words that we need, not the things that come from us. But secondly, we need the unique and exclusive words of Christ. We need the unique and exclusive words of Christ. I'm reminded of chapter 7 and verse 46, chapter 7 of John and verse 46, the Sanhedrin had already sent officers to go out and arrest Jesus and bring him back so they could have a little talk with Jesus, right? But of course, it didn't quite go to plan and 746, the officers came back, actually 45, it says the officers then came to the chief priests and the Pharisees and they said to them, why did you not bring him? Obviously, he's not there with them. And they must have come in with some kind of a sheepish, dazed look. I don't know. It's like, well, we, what, why aren't we bringing him back? And there's their answer. The officers answered, never has a man spoken the way this man speaks. Never has a man spoken like the. His words changed their mind. They were there to arrest him. They were there to bring a storm into Jesus' life. You actually think that once the Sanhedrin got a hold of Jesus, they were just going to sort of like sit around and have a little, you know, little nosh or something like that, get out the cream cheese and the bagels and the locks and everything and just you know, have us a little snacky and then you can kind of explain yourself and then you'll go on and I'll go on. No, 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 no. Jesus' words stopped that storm from taking off and becoming obliterating to Christ. Christ and the apostles. He has unique and exclusive words. No man ever spoke like him. No man in the history of the world ever spoke the way Jesus spoke. See, his word is spirit and life. Spirit. Nobody ever had the words of spirit like Jesus did. Nobody could ever impart the life that comes through the words of Jesus like Jesus spoke. Thirdly, there is in his speaking this joy that comes through Christ's spoken word and the joy of through that comes through that spoken word causes us to survive in John 15. And now verse 11 speaks about that. John 15, 11, he says, These things I have spoken to you so that my joy may be in you and that your joy would be made full. 
That's how I survive. Because it's not just getting through the time of trauma, and, you know, breathing through it, and my heart is still beating on the other end, you know, and I'm a little beat up, but no worse for wear. No, it's going through the storm with joy. It's going through the storm not losing your sense of victory. It's going through the storm and not allowing the circumstance to rip you off and to steal from you. But rather, you walk in that joy of the Lord, which really then you experience does become your strength. Surviving is more than just, I'm still breathing on my way out, you know, the end of this tornado. No, it's going through it in joy. It's the knowledge that the Lord is faithful. The Lord doesn't, that our sister, you know, gave us uh, Hebrews 13, uh, 13, 5. You know, he never leaves me or forsake me. Man, that is so critical. That's something that will give you joy. Jesus says right here in 15, 11, I spoke these things to you so that my joy might be in you. Every time you open up the word, you should be expecting. And I'd say it to the Lord, Lord, I, I, I'm going to read your word and I'm going to receive your joy because you promised in John 15, 11 that these things you spoke to me and are speaking to me today so that my my joy would be full so that my joy would be full because your joy is in me. So Lord, bring it to me. I'm ready for it. Dump it on me. I'm a complete open vessel. Pour it into me. Absolutely. And then go infect somebody else with that. Go infect another brother or sister because there are brothers and sisters in our church that need us to infect them with this encouragement through the spoken word that brings joy. Looking back at chapter 16 now. And verse 1, so these things I have spoken unto you, why, he says, why? So that you may be kept from stumbling. So that you may be kept from stumbling. Scandalizo is our Greek word, a rather typical word in the Greek New Testament. To scandalizo, um, uh, it can be used for one who is scandalizo, can be used for somebody who is so down that they give up the faith, so trapped that they give up, um, uh, so, so down that they, so scandalizo that they fall into sin. But Jesus says, I'm making a way, I'm speaking my word so that you are kept from stumbling or kept from being scandalizo. And I know you want to use the word, the English word scandalize there, but no, the word has changed over time. Scandalizo originally had to do with a hunter's trap. Remember, I think I've told you this before, a hunter's trap. And it could be any number of different styles of trap, but the idea of this trap is to, you know, to uh, cover it up in such a way and make it so, so that the little critter that you're wanting to trap and kill doesn't know that, you know, the boom's about to be lowered on it. And it looks real nice and it looks real tice, enticing. Put a little food in there in that trap, but you've got it set up. Maybe for once it goes in, the door slam, slams shut, or maybe, man, something worse, it comes over and wax on their tail or maybe even kills them right there. This is a hunter's trap. It's a scandalizo. I'm glad the Lord used this word to talk to us about the fact that his word will keep us from being trapped in these ways. His word will keep us from being trapped and falling into an area of death and destruction. Scandalizo. What's your current storm of stumbling? What's your current area that you find yourself getting trapped in? You want out or does it not matter? It's the spoken word of Christ that will release you from that. This storm of stumbling. Which brings us to the second point on your outline. Now he speaks about storms in the synagogues. Storms in the synagogues. He says in verse 2, He will make, or excuse me, they will make you outcasts from the synagogue. Now remember, he's just these 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 verses are not independent one of another. They hang together. All right. So these things I've spoken to you, so that you may be kept from stumbling, from being trapped. Here comes a here comes a possible trap. Right? They, verse two, will make you outcasts from the synagogue. But an hour is coming for everyone who kills you to think that he is offering service to God. Now. Now, why does he speak to them about um, being an outcast from the synagogue, that this is something that's going to happen to them? You know that he has sent them to the lost 
cheap of thank you the house of Israel I figured we'd get to it eventually the lost sheep of the house of Israel all right so Matthew 10 Matthew 10 verses 5 through 6 is the first place Jesus talks about that when he's sending out the 12 by themselves he's letting them go out on their first foray of ministry and he says don't go into the way of the Gentiles go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel because that's that, that's whom Jesus initially comes to minister to the Gentiles the nations come in after that all right and then he says it again to the Canaanite woman with the demon possessed daughter in Matthew 15 and verse 24 right when she says help me help me Lord this demon afflicts my daughter and he says I was not sent except to the lost sheep of the house of Israel and then she makes this and he says to her you know it's not right for you know uh, the dogs calls her a dog the dogs to eat the the bread that's supposed to be given unto the children to the Israelites and then amazing statement of faith she says yes Lord but but even the dogs she didn't try to defend it. She knew she was a dog. She was outside. That means she's outside of the covenant of what it means to be a sheep in Israel. And she says, but even the dogs eat of the crumbs that fall from the master's table. Oh, great is your faith, woman. It's done for you. Just like that. Jesus doesn't even have to be in the vicinity of this little girl with the, with the demon in her. Suddenly, he just says, done, just like that. Because the power is all wrapped up in that anointing and the authority and the fact that he has been given authority over all things in heaven and on earth. And he's passed that along to us. Like casting out demons, for instance. Mark the ninth chapter. And I believe Luke the ninth chapter as well. Mark the ninth chapter, I pointed this out to you. Now, <laughs> the boys, they're out and about. And they come to Jesus and say, well, you know, we saw this guy. You know, he was, he was casting out demons in your name. He, I mean, he was actually doing it, right? Successfully. Uh, but we told him to stop that because he doesn't follow us. So the amazing thing about this is that here's a guy that is not one of the 12, but he obviously believes on Christ. We don't get his name or nothing. He's just a believer out there. See, this is great. He's just a believer. He's the average believer out there, right? Nobody knows who he is. And Jesus says, don't hinder him. Don't cut him off, right? He who does a miracle in my name will not be quick to slaughter his name. So he calls it a miracle. He calls it a miracle. Here's this guy. We don't know who he is. He's not following, you know, with the 12 per se, but he's a believer in Jesus and he's got this authority and he believes it because he's been given that faith from God and now he's walking in this thing. They don't deny that he wasn't doing it. He was doing it. And Jesus said what he was doing was a miracle. Isn't that something? Where does that leave it for you and me? It leaves it for you and me to walk in the same way. How are you going to survive the storms of the demonic? You've got to walk in this authority. You have to know who you are in Christ. You have to know this word in regards to this subject. You have to know your enemy. And you have to be walking it, not just talking it. You have to really be walking in the full armor of God, Ephesians 6, verse 11 and following. You really do, or though I stay away. Stay away. Storms in the synagogues. He's going to send them into the synagogues. And we see that in the opening chapters of the book of Acts. And after the apostle Paul, who was Saul, gets converted, we see him going where? Into the synagogues as he travels around, you know, with Barnabas at first. And then he goes with Silas. And they're going into the synagogues to the Jew first. That is still the command. But then when the people, the Jews in the synagogue, reject the teaching of their Messiah as he brings it to them, he says, that's fine. We shake off the dust will go from now on to the Gentiles. And the Gentiles love this. You know, Acts 13, we first begin to see that going on. But the word keeps rolling first to the Jew first, then to the Gentiles. So he's already said in other places, look, you can expect to be scourged, whipped, beaten in the synagogues. He did that in Matthew 10, 17. Matthew 10, 17. He also prophesied that it would happen in Matthew 23, 34. 23:34 in Acts 22 and verse 9, 19 Acts 22:19 19, the apostle Paul is is speaking he's he's speaking in front of the the Roman uh, the Roman representatives and he speaks about the fact that he made sure that these Christians were whipped and scourged in the synagogues why in, why in the synagogues why in the synagogues it's the place that's going to be casting them out 
The, the synagogues, if you will remember, were never ordered to be started by God. It's not the temple. The synagogues are not many temples. Make sure we understand that. Uh, the temple in Jerusalem is primarily, it became more than this, but if we go back to the tabernacle upon which the temple is based, the temple tabernacle structure is a place of sacrifice, of blood sacrifice. Well, that synagogue is not that. There's only one place where sacrifice can take, can take place, and that, of course, is in Jerusalem, on the Temple Mount, at the specific location, within the temple itself, under priests. And, of course, none of that is happening now. No, there are no genuine priests, and we could go on by this. And this idea that any of this could be, ever be rebuilt and started up again is a complete... Listen, if it, was, if it was attempted to be done, even if you stay away from the New Testament, if it was attempted to be done... It it would be sin. You know why? You know why? Because, because there is no, God's not in the temple. You can read Ezekiel. You can read Ezekiel 10, Ezekiel 11. God is not in the temple and he never came back. He left that temple. He's not there. The mercy seat on the ark is not there. The priests, which are the only ones that can do this, and only a high priest once a year on the Day of Atonement can go in piercing that incredible veil, which Hebrews tells us is a type of Christ's flesh, but I'm trying to stay out of the New Testament here. Even then, there are no Levitical priests. There's no possible way anybody can know if they're one of the Kohanim, the priests, because all the records were kept in the temple. And when it burned down, the records went down with it. That is a fact, Jack. Where did this synagogue idea come from? Well, it's speculation. Seems like when they were uh, in, uh, in Babylonian and Persian bondage, the idea was to create a, a, a sort of a place where the scriptures would be read and discussed and taught. And so the Old Testament, or what we call the Old Testament, which more rightly is referred to as the... Yes, thank you. Tanakh, the elders knew what that was. The Tanakh, exactly. The Torah, the Nevi'im, and the Ketuvim. In other words, the law, the prophets, and the Psalms. In Hebrew, all right? So short for Tanakh. Well, that, that's what synagogue was supposed to be. Um, but that's where all the social life of Israel, that's where um, the idea of uh, uh, if you are right before God and right in Israel, you were an upstanding member of your local synagogue. But it was not a place of sacrifice. It was a place of teaching. But a lot of other things went on in regards to that. Now, verse 2, they will make you outcasts, it says, from the synagogue. Apo synagogos. Apo synagogos is the singular Greek word from which we get translated the phrase outcast from the synagogue. Comes from one Greek word. See, look at that. One Greek word. Talk about a... a, a uh, a work of economy, of linguistic economy, one Greek word, but we need three in English to give the one Greek word. All right, aposunagogos. Aposun it means literally to be excommunicated, excommunicated from the synagogue. And he says, this is what's going to happen to you. There's a storm coming, and you're going to be excommunicated from the synagogues. Now, remember, this is not a light thing. To be, to be excommunicated from the synagogue is to be cut off from all the social and economic aspects of Jewish society. You can lose your job. You can lose your job. And even if you were running your own business or something like that, they won't give you any business. They won't, wherever that town is, there would be a synagogue. And the synagogue runs the show. And you had to be right with those in the synagogue. And if you're not, you're cut off. Well, that means I'm losing my job. It means I'm not making any income and nobody will buy to me. And oh, by the way, nobody will sell to you either. <clears throat> nobody will help you. Talk about shunning. Oh, my gosh. Lose your job. I can't eat. I can't feed my family. So, starvation. Starvation leads to sickness. Sickness leads to death. You get exiled from families when you're out of the synagogue. And here's something interesting. You lose the privilege in Jewish society of an honorable burial. That means you're just thrown into a ditch and covered up, thrown into a hole, maybe an unmarked grave. Horrible. And this is the kind of thing that was greatly feared, greatly feared. Uh, 
we've seen it before in chapter 9 and verse 22. You remember this? The parents of the man that Jesus healed who was born, born blind from birth. 9.22, they, they brought the parents of this guy in before the members of the Sanhedrin, and the parents are scared. His parents said this, that is verse 21, he's of age, ask him. Don't ask us. His parents said this because they were afraid of the Jews, for the Jews had already agreed that if anyone confessed him, that is Jesus, to be the Messiah, he was to be aposunagogos. He was to be ex excommunicated from the synagogue, put out from the synagogue. It, uh, it says the same thing again in chapter 12, verse 42. Chapter 12. Verse 42. This is very, very serious stuff that's going on right here. But now he says, they'll make you excommunicated from the synagogue. Verse 2, but an hour is coming for everyone who kills you to think that he's offering service to God. There is an hour coming concerning Individuals who are not, they're not out to just, to just right a wrong. They're not out to make you feel bad. They're not out to uh, give you a bill or in some way discipline you. They want to kill you because of me, Jesus is saying. Uh, apoktenes is our Greek word here for kill. Apoktenes. Um, it's usually translated kill. It could be translated murder. What is interesting about this is we've got an aorist active participle form. So normally when we translate it into English, we give something in the participle mood, we give it an ing ending. An ing ending. So it's killing. And, and what the participle does right here is it heightens the action of what they are thinking and what's going going to happen. Uh, they are thinking what they are thinking as they are killing you. It's what they are thinking as they are killing you. This hour comes for everyone who kills you to think. So while they are murdering you, what they're thinking, participle, killing you, and they are thinking something in particular, I'm actually serving God. God is pleased with my act of murder. That's what the Greek points to right here. That these people actually think that by me taking you out, I'm doing service to God. You see that word service? Offering service, bottom of verse 2? Latria. The Greek word latria has to do with performance type worship like a priest uh, would do within uh, the, the temple or something like that. In other words, it's performing of religious rites. Latria. I'm actually acting as a priest, slitting your throat. And it's my duty to please the deity in regards to this, latria. Now, in the Greek Septuagint, the translation of the Tanakh, in Exodus 12 and verse 25 and following, where it talks about the Passover, this word latria is used to describe the Passover. So, so that's the level of this word latria. You know what a big deal, of course, the Passover was, okay? It's the same kind of idea. Um, according to the Talmud, in, within the Talmud there are various books, and one of them is called the Book of the Sanhedrin. And in chapter 9, verse 6, of the book of the Sanhedrin, chapter 9, verse 6. It actually, you know, of course, the Talmud, it adds many things to the laws, and then it becomes equally binding uh, because the rabbis have said it, now it's in writing and all this kind of a thing. But in the book of Sanhedrin 9, 6, it talks about the fact that if a man, for instance, was to steal a sacred vessel, it doesn't say what kind of a sacred vessel, but if he was to steal a sacred vessel, then it was the duty of the young men who were really the zealots, they were the zealots, to, to take hold of that man, to fall on him and kill him. Oh, we ought to be able to add that kind of stuff to our bylaws right now. Yeah, the Talmud. Goes on to talk about that if a priest served at the altar and he was in a state of Levitical uncleanness, then the younger priests, that means those 30 and above, were to take him outside of the temple courts, split his skull, and expose his uh, gray matter of his brains. Welcome to the Talmud. Now you're getting a little, 
of why I say some of the things I say to you about the, the Jewish Talmud. See, they think that this is, so well, you can see that they're thinking now when it comes to Christ's disciples and those who are preaching the gospel and representing the things of the Lord Jesus, that this guy, oh, you're following after the, this guy who said he was the Messiah, but he also said he was God and he was blaspheming. That's what they think. He's blaspheming. And so we're going to stop this right now and kill you too. And, of course, this is what they tried to do on several occasions. There's actually, um, uh, in, the, in one commentary section of the Talmud, where it's commenting on Numbers 25, for instance, in verse 13, there's a quote in there that says this, Everyone who sheds the blood of the godless is like one who brings an offering. Yeah. Before his conversion, the Apostle Paul felt the same way. And he acted on those same, those same Talmudic principles. Um, if you take a look at Acts uh, 26, for instance. Acts 26, or just write it down and listen to me, I'll read it to you. In Acts 26, verses 9 through 11, he's in front of Agrippa making his defense. <clears throat> and he says, so then... This is talking about before he was in Christ. So then, I thought to myself, the Apostle Paul says, when he was Saul, that I had to do many things hostile to the name of Jesus of Nazareth. He says, and this is just what I did in Jerusalem. Not only did I lock up many of the saints in prisons, having received authority from the chief priests, but also when they were put to death, I cast my vote against them. And as I punished them often in all the synagogues, fulfilling Jesus' words in John 16. I punished them often in all the synagogues. I tried to force them to blaspheme and being furiously enraged with them. He's just opening himself up. This is what was driving him. You know, this whole idea of everyone who sheds the blood of the godless is like one who brings an offering. So I'm furiously enraged against them, he says. I kept pursuing them even to foreign cities, doggedly, doggedly, doggedly. And then he goes on with more of that. He speaks some of the same language about his past before he was in Christ in Galatians 1, verses 13 and 14. Galatians 1, verses 13 and 14. Matter of fact, today we have militant Muslims that practice the same sort of thing in jihad. They practice the same kind of a things. I'll have more to say about that in a little bit. Let's go to the third and final point. We're back in John 16. Third and final point. Now he talks to us about a storm that is based on a certain seclusion. And the seclusion is really found in verse 3. These things they will do because they have not known the Father or me. They are secluded from the Father and from the Lord Jesus in particular. They are secluded. Um, let's read verses 3 and 4 all together. These things they will do because they have not known the Father or me, but these things I have spoken to you so that when their hour comes, you will remember that I told you of them. Let's just stop right there. So what we've got here in verse 3, they're doing this, but they're doing it based upon the fact that they're secluded from having any relationship with me or the Father. They don't even know who we are. In other words, having, having a biblical knowledge or a relationship. They're killing. Their killing is based on ignorance. And what it really is, is when somebody does this, now he's speaking to the Jews right now, that when they do this, it really is a personal testimony that their view of their religion is a false one. That's what it is. Because they, these things they will do because they have not known the Father or, or me. When you have to make death and the threat of death in conversion... It actually denies the power of that deity to change that person's heart. Very simple. Very simple. Then, uh, if that's the God that you serve, and the only way that I can get you to convert is through the threat of some sort of physical harm, what does that say about your God? Your God can't draw me. Your God can't convince me. Your word that you say you have, you know, that is supposed to be from your God, can't do it. So rather you've got to, like, juice it up and... It's a false conversion. Don't you see that? But see, they don't see it that way. This is the depth of their fallenness in Adam working in tandem with their false religion. 
Now the context here, of course, is the actions of the Jews against Christ and his followers that testifies that the Jews had no relationship with God. That's what Jesus is saying in verse 3 right here. Very important to get it that way. He says in verse 3, these things they will do. These things they will do. What? what? Well, verse 2, they will excommunicate you, right? They will murder you, yes? All the while thinking that they are pleasing God by doing that. Um, I don't know if you caught some of the, there was a lots of news on Fox yesterday. They were uh, um, scanning the different uh, uh, government um, meetings. Um, I, I'm forgetting right offhand what some of them are called. But persecution specifically against Christians is up right now, really up in the world. Um, and it's especially up in regards to Islamic governments against Christians. And they don't do anything to protect the Christians. It's like if groups, Islamic groups within, are out and they're going door to door, however they're doing it, and they're, they're slaughtering uh, Christians, putting them to death, um, locking them up in jail or something like that. They're just letting it happen, just letting it happen. All right? now, now, this has a lot to do with what we're talking about right here. Because the Islamics think, I should have Tony talk about this at this point. The Islamics think that they're doing Allah a service. Uh, consider, I got four things for you to consider on this idea. Number one, no one who hates Christ or, or his father has any clue as to who God is. None. Uh, John 15 and verse 21. John 15 and verse 21. Jesus says, but all these things they will do to you for my name's sake because they do not know the one who sent me. It, you know, and in Islam, they do claim that Jesus, I Isu, yes, uh, was sent from Allah and that he is one prophet among many prophets. Okay. Um, but he certainly is not the son of God. Now, I have a copy of the Koran. It's in English. You know, I can't do what you do. But it's a... It's a not many people can read in Arabic anyway. Oh, well, okay. I, uh, thank you, brother. That makes me feel better. I, I, I feel better. Yes, <laughs> that way. I mean, I'm pretty much a Greek guy. Okay, Greek New Testament. And then into the Old Testament, you know, for, for our Hebrew. But I'm like way gone in regards to, to Aramaic. But anyway, I've got my translation. And my translation's all marked up. I got all the little, the, I got all the little you know, post-it notes, you know, in the pages. And I've got it underlined because I want to know what the heck they, they deny that Jesus, of course, even died on the cross. That's gone. They deny that he was, of course, he was not born of a virgin. Rather, Mary was a woman who got herself knocked up. You stop me if I'm getting anything wrong. She got herself knocked up. You know. And Jesus' father is just some guy out there. They name somebody. I forget who, who he is. Uh, anyway, they deny the Trinity. And, and they deny, 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 deny. I mean, the bedrock foundations of what God has done in history prophesied through the word that would, in fact, be taking place. These things they will do because they have not known the Father of me. So no one who hates Christ or his Father has a clue who God is. Secondly, no one who denies, who denies the Son has the Father. No one who denies the Son has the Father. That's 1 John 2, 23. Because Jesus is the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father except by me. 1 John 2, 23 says what I just said prior. Thirdly, no one who does not live in the teaching of Christ has the Father. That's 2 John 9. If you're not daily living, and the word that is used there is abiding. I've substituted the word living. If you're not abiding in the teaching of Christ, then you don't have the Father. See, look at that expectation when somebody says that they're a Christian. And that's a, that phrase needs to be redefined. Carrie and I just decided last night, that phrase needs to be redefined. <laughs> I got with my wife, and that's the end of that, okay? But think about it. I mean, from at least the 70s probably forward. Back in the 50s here in the United States, a Christian, that had some, that, I believe that term had some meat. Now, I was pretty tiny back then, okay? I was like that. <laughs> but, but, you know, from what I have studied and folks I have talked to, Christians back then, it was different. But Christianity now, you just watch some of the stuff that I watch on TV, you know, in regards to people don't know what a Christian is. They don't have a biblical working definition as to what a Christian is because in their minds, especially with the current pope and everything, man, you know, sin is like, it's okay. 
It's all right. What the Bible calls sin, it's like, well, you just shouldn't judge anybody. But the Bible in the New Testament says to judge them. It says to do it in the church. It says that you need to make a judgment about what is right or wrong based on what God says, what the Word says. It says to make a judgment. It says to bring that sinning person in before the congregation and make a judgment. And if they don't repent, out they go. That's a judgment. You deliver them over to Satan, which is excommunication. What do you think that is? Go get me a hot dog. I like onions and relish? No, it's casting out. It's giving him back to the world of where he needs to go. I'm, I'm sorry I don't allow people to interrupt me. <laughs> What'd you say? You won't get their donation every Sunday. Oh, yes, I will. <laughs> because it's the Lord doing it, not me. <laughs> but, but, but he's right, you see. There's a Frank, what he points out is, as a lot of men won't say what needs to be said because they're afraid. They're afraid of losing out on the finances. They're afraid uh, you won't be in the pew or in the seat next Sunday. You'll leave. They're, they're afraid. They're too busy thinking about their own stuff and all that goes along with that. Man, I've screwed that up historically forever. Are you kidding me? I'm, I'm way past that. Fourthly, dis <laughs> dishonoring the son is dishonoring the father. See? You dishonor the son, you do dishonor the father. John 5, 23 speaks about that. i got to wrap this up. And so he says, these things in verse 3, they will do because they have not known me or the father. They have no intellectual knowledge of who this one true God is, and they have no relationship with the father. And this is why, this is a testimony to their lack of relationship. And Jesus is saying, this storm is coming to you guys, he says to his 11. This storm, because you're going into these synagogues, and you'll be ministering the word, my word, and you'll be telling them that I've been raised from the dead and you'll be telling them that I have fulfilled all that was written about me in the law of the prophets and the Psalms. And they're going to reject that. Some will listen, but some will try to kill you. And the, the, the foundation behind them trying to kill you is I'm actually doing God a service by shutting this guy up. And the, the best example of that is the Apostle Paul's own testimony before he was in Christ and what he used to do. We just read a quick example of that. And then he says, verse 4, but these things I've spoken unto you. There's that second sandwich, right? The top, verse 1, these things I've spoken to you. Bottom of verse 4, but these things I've spoken unto you and everything in between. Then he goes, so that when their hour comes. You see, these people who bring this storm of persecution, they have an hour. They have a time. God sets it aside. When, when they arrested Jesus in the Garden of Gethsemane in Luke's gospel, Jesus says to them, but this is your hour and the power of darkness. But that doesn't mean God has let go. That this is all under control. And I've showed you how, how much Jesus was in control of that entire scenario all the way to the cross, I including his death. In John 10, he prophesied and he said, no man takes my life from me, right? I lay it down in my own accord. I have power to lay it down. I have power to take it again, which is referring to what? Resurrection. Yeah, resurrection. Exactly correct. I mean, incredible. See, he... he People have got to make a decision. He really is the Lord of glory. He really is. Or he's not. We're all just deceived. There's no halfway to this. And I got, I got, I got people on TV I see who claim to be Christians. I've, I've listened to them. And they claim to be Christians. But you know what? You need to not be homophobic. You need to not be homophobic, they'd say. Excuse me, I don't like that term. That's an unbiblical term. The term you're reaching for, I think the term you want is sodomite. That's the biblical term, a sodomite. A sodomite is a man that inserts his into the backside of another man. Hello? Sodomy. That's what it is. And you've got 2% of the population that wants special, significant treatment and want to be equal with everybody else just because of the way they want to have sex. That's it. And I got people in the Roman Catholic Church. I heard a dumb old Bill O'Reilly. Man, he's got the, his mouth is fitted for his shoe size now. But, you know, he, he says, yeah, the Roman Catholic Church, you know, I mean, it's like, you can have those feelings, but you just can't act on it. No! 
The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 6, verse 9, don't be deceived. The old man will get into the kingdom who is, and he gives two specific words for homosexuals. He talks about, he talks about the soft one who plays the woman in the homosexual relationship, and he talks about the male that plays the male in a homosexual relationship. Those people will not get into the kingdom. The Bible doesn't divide up like, <laughs> like there's an acceptable arena for sin. No, see, that's the problem. It's what's going on inside. Jesus said it. You know, you can be an adulterer, he said, without ever acting on it. Because it's the lust that goes on inside of your heart, he says. It's the exact same thing for homosexuals. It's the same thing for any kind of sin. It just happens to be one of the hot button issues in the country right now. And our Department of Justice, you know, is going crazy with this, trying to force equal rights for homosexuals that would be uh, under heterosexual marriage couples, giving the homosexuals the same rights that the heterosexual has, and they're trying to blast it through each state. But according to the way our government is set up, a state is sovereign. Regarding, to, regarding its own laws under the Constitution. Sorry. Sorry. And people need to stand up. They need to get up. They need to stop. Get all those lazy boys. And I love my lazy boy. I got gotcha. you. But you can't. That's why I'm glad we're doing this and it goes out. And it does what it does. They have a certain time set aside and controlled by God in order to sin in this way, in order to kill God's people, in order to cast them out of the synagogue. But God's purposes concerning the church and his glory are allowed to stand when their hour comes, not if it comes, but when it comes. It is coming. I'm bypassing a lot of things to get finished here. He says specifically that when these things I've spoken to you, so that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told you of them. Remember what? Remember Christ's word. It contains that added feature of recall in the New Testament. Christ's word contains a special added bonus feature. It's called recall. It's a recall mechanism that's added so that you can use it. The recall medicine, uh, mechanism is tripped by the person of the Holy Spirit, according to John 14, 26. The Holy Spirit will bring back to your minds all the things that I have said unto you. It's also in Acts 11 and verse 16 and Acts 20 and verse 35. Acts 11 and verse 16 and Acts 20, verse 35. That's one recall mechanism, which is the Holy Spirit. Another recall me mechanism is, is found in your very soul, according to the Hebrew rendering of this. And God trips that, and that's found. You're going to love this. And I, I wanted to read it. But I think I will read it. Lamentations, I know. What's a lamentation? Do they come, you know, with a bunch of sheep or something? No. Lamentations right by Jeremiah, yes. Right after Jeremiah's book, and it's Lamentations 3, and it's verses 19 through 23. Listen to this. Lamentations 3, verses 19 through 23. Listen to this. Verse 19 says, Remember my affliction, he's praying to God, and my wandering, the wormwood, the bitterness. This is the aftermath of the Babylonian overthrow and destruction of the southern kingdom. And he's sitting in the ashes, as it were, of Jerusalem. He says, surely my soul remembers and is bowed down within me. This I recall to my mind. Therefore, I have hope. Now, here's what he recalls. Here's what his soul flips the switch on in regards to recall. The Lord's loving kindness indeed never ceases, for his compassions never fail. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. That's in the Christian, that's in the believer's life. That's in their soul. Oh my gosh. Thirdly, 
That recall happens as we consider the teaching of the word or meditate on the teaching of the word. And that's 2 Timothy 2.7. 2 Timothy 2.7 where Paul says to Timothy, remember, meditate, consider these things that I've just spoken to you and the Lord will give you understanding. So the teacher kicks in. 1 John 2.20 and 2.27. The Holy Spirit as our teacher begins to kick in in this way. And so... These things, he says in verse 4, I did not say unto you at the beginning because I was with you. Bottom of verse 4. These things I did not say to you at the beginning because I was with you. See, as long as Jesus was physically present, then Jesus was going to take, he present with the disciples, Jesus would take the brunt of these attacks that the members of the Sanhedrin brought to them. He protected them. He covered them. He took the blows. But now Jesus is leaving. Now we're back to the beginning of the teaching. Jesus is leaving, right? And now he's getting them ready because they're going to direct their attacks against his followers. They're going to direct his attacks against... And you, you see it happening in Acts 15. Acts 15, starting at verse 18. Acts 15, 18 through 16, verse 4. 15, 18 through 16, verse 4. Remember what Paul said in Colossians 1.24. We've been there recently. Colossians 1.24, basically Paul says Jesus isn't around to get anymore, so they get us instead. They get us instead. So how do we wrap this up? How do we wrap up surviving the storms? Well, surviving our storms, whether they're personal or they're part of our congregation, means that we recall what the Word has spoken to us about these life storms. Remember John 6, 63, that Jesus says, My words are spirit and they are life. That's a recall that we need to have. Secondly, remember that a religiously driven persecution against believers is a persecution of murder. It's murderous. And thirdly, that those who persecute us are demonstrating by their, the profession of their own actions that they have no clue as to who God is. Because they got to get you to convert to their way of thinking through the threat of death. What? Where's the integrity? Where is the, where, even on a human level, where is the rational argument and the logic that would convince me of your position? Well, you don't have one because you must force it at the end of a gun. I must confess your God at the end of your gun. Catholic, Roman Catholic Church was real good uh, at that during the Middle Ages and all the way up through past the persecution, a persecution, the Reformation. Fourth and finally, Christ's word comes with the added feature of recall. As long as we meditate, consider, think on his word, this is how we survive life storms, and the storms are coming. They're brewing. We're under them now as we look up and we see the twirling that's going on. This is how we get through it. This is how we survive. And so, Lord God, just as you caused your disciples to survive after you uh, ascended in the first century, so the same mechanisms are in place that causes us to survive. How grateful we are, O oh Father, to know that you haven't left us as orphans. You said you would come back to us, and we understand in the context of that it was coming back to us in the person of the Holy Spirit. How gracious and good and wonderful and kind you are to do these things for us now, Lord. Now I ask, Lord God, that you would give recall of this teaching and thy biblical truth, Lord, to my precious people here, and, I, and that you would bring your blessing upon them to know you greater, to be able to stand firmer, Lord God, and to be able to stand in all your armor so that when the storm hits, when the lightning strikes, when the twister comes and tries to level the houses of our lives, we will stand firm. Because it's your word that we're standing in. Thank you for these things tonight. Now, Lord God, I ask for you to just bless them and keep them. Make your face to shine upon them, O oh God, and be gracious unto them. Lift up your countenance upon them tonight and give them peace. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen.